Well, throughout history, there have been many, many wars, and they have started and stopped for different reasons. And in this lesson, we'll be taking a look at the conflict known as the Cold War and how it came to an end. So let's take a look at our lesson question, why did the Cold War come to an end? Let's get started. Well, in this lesson, we're going to be learning about the end of the Cold War. And to learn about this, we're going to look at this topic in three parts. First, we're going to explain why relations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union began to improve. Then we're going to take a look at the reforms enacted by the Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev. And finally, we're going to take a look at why the Soviet Union collapsed. Let's take a look at our words to know for this lesson. You have two academic vocabulary words, authority and limitation. You also have some domain-specific words, detente, glasnost, perestroika, and summit. You may want to jot these words down and uh, make note of them as you learn about them in the lesson. Well, now let's take another look at our lesson question. Why did the Cold War come to an end? And to answer this question, we're going to divide it up into three parts. First, we're going to learn more about the policy of detente. Then we're going to learn about two of the leaders of the Cold War as the Cold War came to an end, President Ronald Reagan and Soviet Premier Gorbachev. And then we're going to learn about the events leading to the collapse of the USSR. But before we get started, let's take a closer look at the events leading up to the Cold War and how this is leading to tension between these two nations. Now remember, following World War II, the U.S. and the Soviet Union are going to uh, be involved in a conflict in which both nations are trying to exert influence over the world. And they're going to compete in many different areas. In international influence, they're going to get involved in an arms race involving nuclear weapons like the ICBM that you see pictured here. And these tensions are going to lead to standoffs and proxy wars around the world, including locations like Berlin, in Germany, in Korea, and in Cuba. But what starts to happen in the 1970s is that the relations between the two nations begin to improve, and that's where we're going to start our discussion today. Now, before we move on, let's take another look at our lesson question, why did the Cold War come to an end? And you just learned that relations between the two nations are starting to improve. This is a time period known as detente, and we're going to start our lesson by learning about this time period. Well, there are two important factors leading to detente, or a temporary easing of Cold War tensions. The first is the nuclear buildup. Now, remember, both the Soviet Union and the United States were building lots and lots of nuclear weapons, and these weapons were going more powerful, and they were also starting to build missiles, allowing those weapons to be a shot over a much longer distance. So that was increasing tensions because, remember, in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the arms race almost led to an actual shooting war between the Soviets and uh, the United States. The second big issue are increasing uh, involvement in crises around the world in places like Korea and Vietnam. And uh, leaders began to worry that perhaps uh, those proxy wars would eventually result in a shooting war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And that could be disastrous, not just for those two countries, but for other countries around the world. So what starts to happen in the 1970s is that the two nations began to negotiate a series of of nuclear arms limitation treaties. And so what this means is the countries start to discuss how to limit the number of nuclear weapons that each one uh, possesses or can deploy. So there are two important treaties that are signed in the 1970s. The first is called SALT-1 and was signed not only by the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but by other countries as well. And it capped the number of nuclear arms that any nation could produce and it also limited the number of launch sites. So those are places where those arms uh, could be, missiles could be launched from. So the second treaty is SALT II, and it was signed later in 1979. Now, it limited the number of ICBM launchers. So again, the two nations are trying to take steps to limit the number of nuclear weapons that each can possess. It also banned any kind of new missile programs that were designed to create more powerful or longer-range weapons. Now, this treaty, unfortunately, is never going to be signed. It's never going to be ratified by Congress because in 1979, something else happened, and that's the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. 
And this is actually going to bring an end to their time, and it's going to increase tensions between the two nations once again. Well, let's start by looking at United States President Ronald Reagan. Now, Ronald Reagan uh, believed that previous uh, administrations of folks to the Cold War had been a failure. He felt that containment obviously had not worked, and he proclaimed that the U.S. was going to have a new policy uh, when it came to the Cold War, and that was to win. So he's going to abandon detente. He felt that negotiating with the Soviets hadn't produced any results. Instead, uh, the Soviets, for example, invaded Afghanistan in order to spread communism there. So instead, in his effort to win the Cold War, he's going to take a couple of actions. Uh, one is he's going to create a program called the Strategic Defense Initiative. And this is a program of satellites that could be launched into space and could therefore shoot down any incoming missiles. And this was a huge threat to the Soviets because, uh, first, they felt it was certainly possible to enact uh, such a program, and they felt that they could not possibly enact one of their own to protect the Soviet Union. So the fact that it was never deployed really doesn't mean anything. It was the threat of such a deployment that really affected uh, the Soviet response to that program. The second thing that he did is that he believed the U.S. could win the Cold War by simply outstanding the USSR, that America had far more economic resources than uh, the Soviet Union had, and by building up the U.S. military, it would therefore force the Soviets to build up their military as well, and that in that way the United States could force uh, the Soviets into an untenable economic position. So let's take a look at his Cold War strategy. Now, he's going to have two separate strategies, uh, one in his first term, and uh, then he's going to change quite a bit in his second term. So, in his first term, he's very uh, far more aggressive than previous U.S. presidents have been, and he's also very confrontational. For example, he gave a speech in which he uh, tells the people of Eastern Europe that the West has not forgotten them, that they understand the problems that they've had living under Soviet control, and he really tried to bring attention to human rights abuses in the Soviet Union. Things like imprisoning uh, people uh, for things that they write, imprisoning political prisoners for many, many years, and he really tried to draw attention to the differences between a free democracy and life in the Soviet Union. Again, he also focused on military uh, buildup. For example, he uh, proposed a 600 ship navy, allowing the U.S. to operate all around the world. And he began to engage in conflict worldwide, sending uh, monetary aid and assistance to countries fighting communism, such as the rebels in Afghanistan and those in Nicaragua. Now, as a result of these policies, uh, by the time that uh, Reagan takes his second term in 1985, he feels that the U.S. is able to negotiate again, but this time from a position of strength. By 1985, uh, the Soviet Union has problems. Not only are they losing influence around the world, but they're also starting to lose uh, influence in Eastern Europe. And they simply aren't able to hold on to all these satellite states that they have ruled over for so many years. So what Reagan does is he begins to hold summits or meetings with Soviet leaders in which they can discuss not only arms limitations, but changes that could occur in the Soviet Union uh, in exchange for more trade or aid and so forth. He agreed to ban some nuclear missiles, and he then began to scale back U.S. involvement in conflicts around the world. Well, now let's take a look at the Soviet leader during this time period, and his name is Mikhail Gorbachev. He became the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, and he was very young, uh, in his 50s, uh, when he became the leader of the Soviet Union, much younger than the men who had preceded him. Now, uh, he understood that there were uh, severe economic problems in the Soviet Union, especially with regard to supply of consumer goods, with food. Shortages were very, very common, and he believed that the Soviet Union had to change. Otherwise, uh, they were uh, going to collapse. They were facing increasing social and economic pressures from the West, and he believed that by initiating some limited reforms in government, that perhaps uh, the Soviet Union could survive. So let's take a look at those uh, reform programs, and there are two. The first is called Perestroika, and Perestroika in Russian means restructuring. 
And the goal of perestroika was to reduce the government control of the economy. Remember, under a communist economic system, the government controls all the means of production, decides what's going to be produced and how many are going to be produced. And by uh, allowing some free market influences, uh, Gorbachev felt that perhaps some of those shortages problems uh, could be uh, reduced. In addition, he also allowed the election of some non-party candidates. Now remember, during this time, the Soviet Union is a single-party state, and all government officials are members of the Soviet Communist Party. So Gorbachev starts to let other parties' candidates run for political office. So these are very radical reforms uh, in the Soviet Union. The second program was called Glasnost, and that means openness. And it provided for open elections, allowing people, again, to vote for multiple candidates, allowing more people to vote. It began to allow people to criticize the government and speak out, so we're allowing a little more free speech, and they're granting some freedom of the press. Now, this is going to have some incredible effects in the Soviet Union. First, let's talk about the economic effects. Uh, for the first time uh, since the Soviets took control, some private ownership of business is allowed. People are allowed to go out and start their own businesses. Farmers and factory managers are allowed to have more authority uh, in their domains. And so, uh, as a result, economic production, uh, the Soviets hope, will begin to increase. Next, the political changes. As we said, it's the end of one-party politics. And that debate over government policies are allowed for the first time. And finally, cultural changes. And many uh, historians credit these changes as being the most important because they're going to inspire the Soviet people to rise up against the government and overthrow it. They're getting exposure to new ideas, music, and other uh, things from the West, and also increased access to news and media. So instead of just getting one story, the story from the government, uh, because again, the government in the past had controlled all the newspapers and television, they're starting to hear what other people have to say about their country, about their government, and ways that they can change. Well, let's check in and take another look at our lesson question, why did the Cold War come to an end? Well, you now know about detente and how President Reagan decided uh, to abandon that program in an effort to try to win the Cold War. You also learned about uh, Premier Gorbachev and the new programs that he instituted to institute some reforms in the Soviet Union, Glasnost and Perestroika. Well, now we're going to learn about how those no new programs and the problems in the Soviet Union are going to lead to the collapse of communism, not just in the Soviet Union, but in countries uh, throughout Eastern Europe. So let's learn about that next.
Well, now let's take a look at our timeline. And uh, we started off by learning about detente, that time of decreasing tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And during this time period, two treaties were signed. Well, in 1980, uh, President Reagan uh, becomes president. We start to see tensions increase again until in 1985, uh, Gorbachev becomes premier of the Soviet Union. And we know his reform policies are eventually going to lead to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, the end of the Cold War is going to have other important effects as well. In 1989, the Berlin Wall is finally going to come down, and eventually we'll see the reunification of Germany. And in 1992, the collapse of communism results in a war in Yugoslavia. And as you study World History more, you'll learn more about these events.